Good morning, everyone, and welcome. I'm Jill Doherty. I'm a global fellow at the Wilson Center at the Kennan Institute here at the Wilson Center. And I'm also an adjunct professor at Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service. And uh, a, a, uh, let's say a person who's been to Russia a number of times, both as a student and as a journalist. And I'm very glad to be monitoring and uh, moderating today's event. It's part of the Kennan Institute's Black History Month programming. And I'm particularly pleased to have two outstanding guests. They're both colleagues and their friends, and they are Yelena Kanga and Ann Simmons. Our discussion is entitled, Behind the Story, Black Journalists in Russia and Eurasia. And you know, events in Russia and Eurasia are always in the headlines, of course, but we don't always hear the stories of the journalists who are behind those stories, the ones who actually go out, do the interviews, talk with people and collect information. And we don't often hear about journalists who are journalists of color, and this morning, we're going to be talking to two of them, Yelena Kanga, as I said, and Ann Simmons. They are going to discuss uh, their experiences as Black and also female journalists in that region. They're going to talk about the challenges and opportunities that they've faced and the future of journalism as they see it for journalists and people of color who cover those regions. So I know we're gonna have a lot of questions and I'm sure you're already thinking about those. We have a number of ways to do it. If you want to ask questions, you can uh, submit via email to kenan at wilsoncenter.org, kenan at wilsoncenter.org, or you can go on Twitter at Kenan Institute or you can go on our Facebook page. And when you do, if you would please give your name and your affiliation when you're sending those questions. So I want to uh, first give kind of a brief introduction of our speakers. They both have fascinating backgrounds. And then I'm gonna give them the floor to talk a little bit about uh, their personal upbringing and how they became uh, journalists and also their connection to Russia. Obviously, Yelena has a very direct connection. And Yelena Kanga, again, brief version with her background, which is quite, quite interesting. Yelena is a Russian journalist. She's a talk show host. She was born and raised in the Soviet Union. She spends most of her time, uh, both per personally and professionally, in Russia in Europe and in the United States. And she wrote a really fantastic book, Soul to Soul, A Black Russian Jewish Woman's Search for Her Roots. And Lena, I remember uh, meeting you for the first time way back in the mid, I think maybe even early 1980s. And I remember hearing your family's history. Could you tell our audience a little bit about that? Hi, first of all, thank you for inviting me to this wonderful, fantastic event. I really appreciate it. And in two words, um, yes, I'm Russian. I was born and raised in Moscow, but my ancestors came from the United States uh, on my mother's side. My great grandfather was um, a slave and he used to live in Mississippi, Yazi County. Um, my grandfather was among first African Americans that uh, entered the university, Tuskegee University. Um, later on, he fell in love with my grandmother. There was a very touching story. Uh, the way they met was my grandmother, Bertha Bialik, she was a daughter of a rabbi. They lived in New York. And uh, one day, my grandmother was attending some kind of a demonstration for a female, I don't know, feminists rally. And uh, she was arrested. And at the same time, my grandfather was on a civil rights movement rally, and he was arrested as well. So they met in jail. They fell in love. And that was the beginning of a beautiful love story. And later, um, they moved to Russia, to the Soviet Union, where my mother was born. She was born in Uzbekistan, Tashkent. 
Um, and later on, she married an African uh, politician who used to be a, later on a prime minister of Tanzania. He was assassinated, but I was born in Moscow, and that's how I became Black Russian, born and raised in Moscow. That is really an incredible story. No wonder you wrote a book about it, and I would urge people to read it. And again, just a reminder, if you have questions, three ways to do it, email Kennan at wilsoncenter.org, Twitter at Kennan Institute, and our Facebook page. And tell us who you are and where you come from. Uh, Ann Simmons. Okay, Ann is the Wall Street Journal's Moscow bureau chief. She spent almost three decades working all over the world, Europe, Africa, the Middle East, North America. She was the, before that, she was the LA Times bureau chief in Nairobi and Johannesburg. And she began her career in journalism in the early 1990s in Russia with Time Magazine. And uh, when I look at her um, academic background, Anne, I have to say, <laughs> double honors bachelor's degree in Russian and Norwegian uh, from the University of East Anglia in Norwich, England, and a master's degree, of course, from Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism in New York. So Anne, with all of that, how did you get interested specifically in this part of the world that we're concerned with, Russia, Eurasia, former Soviet Union? Well, thank you so much for having me, Jill, first of all, and I'm glad to join both you and uh, my very good friend, Liana. Um, my story is uh, quite different to, to Liana's. Obviously, I'm not a Black Russian. I was born and raised in London, England, um, of Caribbean heritage, Grenada to be precise. And when I was in high school, in secondary school, um, there was a choice to study languages when you were like 11 years old. And to cut a very long story short, at my particular secondary school, if you didn't choose to learn French, you were put in the Russian, German, Italian, <laughs> or Spanish class, I believe. And I was put in the Russian class. And I developed a, a passion for Russian literature and history and I really wanted to know what the hell was going on behind that iron curtain that everyone kept talking about. So I decided to continue my studies in Russian and went to university to do so. And actually, the first time I came to Moscow was in the early 1980s, in 1984, as a student. And think about this, there are 12 million people approximately in Moscow. And at that time, very few people of color and I bump into Yelena Hunger, <laughs> you know, the, a, another black person in a population of 12 million people. And uh, we've been, uh, we've had a long time friendship. We met just very briefly. And I, the reason I'm mentioning this is because it gets into the conversation we'll have later. That when we met, we were both, um, I think it was at a gym, Yena. I was playing yeah, basketball. Yeah, university, Moscow State University That's gym. That's right. And you were playing tennis. She's a very good tennis player. And we were in the changing room and we spotted each other. And it was, it, we both looked at each other. And I think then we even had stereotypes because when I said I was from Great Britain, you gave me a look, Liana, and then when you said that you were Russian, I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and that, that you said, so those stereotypes did exist then. I, um, I came back uh, to Russia um, in the early 1990s with Time magazine, and then subsequently I came back um, on a fellowship in 2014 for the Los Angeles Times, and now I'm back for the Wall Street Journal. Well, quite a history. And that, that's fantastic. Meeting in the gym in Moscow. Of course. What else? <laughs> so um, maybe, Anne, I think I'm going to start with you. And again, reminder to the audience, uh, I won't bore you again with descriptions of how you can ask questions, but I'll repeat that later. Be thinking of some questions as we go along. So, Anne, you know, um, going back, I was in Russia a little bit before you, uh, back in the late 60s and early 70s. And I remember in, in uh, Leningrad at the time, um, I was an exchange student. And there were students, of course, in at Leningrad State University. In fact, I had one who was a friend, Vincent from Nigeria. And then there were students um, 
in Moscow at Patrice Lumumba University. So bringing African exchange students to Russia, to the Soviet Union, was a very big part of the soft power of the Soviet Union. And I'm just thinking over the years, of course, Soviet Union is gone, things have changed. And can you kind of talk us, um, and this gets complicated, but if you could kind of walk us through the evolution, I think, in, in regard to Russia's view of people of color. Well, it's very interesting, and speaking from my personal perspective, when I came in the early 1980s, there were uh, fewer people of color, but there were many uh, African students who were from countries that were once on the road to socialism, from Angola, from Congo, to Ethiopia, all over, and they were studying here, and many of them received large uh, grants, um, stipends from the, the Soviet government, and uh, did quite well. They were studying things like animal husbandry and international law. And as you mentioned, um, many of them studied, in Moscow at least, at Patricia Lumumba Friendship University. Um, and it was interesting because at that time, um, there was still a bit of antagonism uh, towards African students. And I would say it was you know, more unusual. People would stop and stare. I had that. There was a lot of curiosity, but also a lot of ignorance. There was also, you know, the, um, the veneer, and this could have been at the time Soviet propaganda, that everyone is equal here. And if you are an African student, you have as many rights as anybody else, and no one is to do anything bad to you. And that was actually something that everyone felt they could study quite well and were happy. Fast forward to the early 1990s, and this period of time is sometimes called the kind of Wild West, if you wish, of Russia. After the demise of the Soviet Union, it was almost as if everything went, you know, everything goes from, you know, this is the kind of on the road to capitalism. We've got to try everything that we never, ever had the opportunity to do before. But there was also a lot of gangsterism and, and banditry. And there was a lot of, there was a rise of kind of the, the far right movement and a lot of animosity um, towards people of color, black people. I say in particular, uh, African students, um, there, were, there were some really awful incidents of people being attacked. I've got to interject, but I, I, I personally never had um, any kind of uh, attack or overt discrimination against me. It was almost more like, um, you know, are you a man or a woman? Because I'm six foot two. <laughs> not, you know, my God, is that really a female? <laughs> not used to seeing tall black women. And then fast forward to, to now, even to, to the 2000s, especially in Moscow and St. Petersburg, the big cities, people don't bat an eyelid. This is now, these are very modern cities. They're, the people have become accustomed to seeing people of color. If you do go out into the, uh, into the hinterlands, um, and when I'm reporting out there, there is a bit more curiosity. Or if you go to remote parts of Russia or to some of the other kind of uh, autonomous republics uh, or out to you know, Siberia, to Yakutia, for example, where people still want to take your photograph because they're not used to seeing black people. Um, there is a lot more curiosity out there, and I can speak a, a bit more about this later on, but it can work to your disadvantage and very much to your advantage. Hmm. Yeah, interesting, interesting. You know, I want to get into kind of, I guess, a question about racism a little bit later, but right now I wanted to go to Liana because, you know, the whole idea, and here in the United States over the past year or so, we've been really consumed with this idea of identity. And I know even in Russia, the issue of identity, who are we, um, you know, et cetera, it is, it's a big issue in Russia. And so, Lena, if you could explain, and again, I have to preface almost every question with <clears throat> the idea that these are complex issues. We come at them, I think, at least from the United States, from a perception of you know, racism, slavery, civil war. We have a very specific uh, focus. In Russia, it's different. So talking about identity, Yana, um, I know you're Russian, but are you Russian, totally Russian, 
Are you Russian with a difference? How are you, how do you perceive yourself and how are you perceived by other Russians? Well, that's a very complicated question. Uh, yes, I was born and raised in Moscow. I was um, a Komsomol girl, a pioneer girl. Aktibryong, uh, this is a tiny little you know, young communist girl. So I went through every stage that any, any, any Russian person goes. But I look in the mirror when I used to be a little girl and I was asking my question, why am I black? Why don't I look like the rest of the world? And I really wanted to look like the rest of the world as any kid that doesn't want to stand out. In fact, I used to speak Russian with my grandmother that was American. And I would speak very loud to make sure that everybody hears me speaking Russian. So there would be no mistake that I'm like everybody and I'm Russian. When I grew up a little bit, I became older, we started gathering with other black Russians, the descendants of uh, Americans, African-Americans that came to the Soviet Union in early thirties with my grandfather. There were five families and we used to get together and we talked and uh, the females, young females, they were saying that we have to marry somebody that look like us. But there were not many people that look like us. And we were saying, we have to go back home. Well, the word home, we, you, we never knew what home was. Uh, is it home in Africa? Is it home in America? Where is it home? But we used to say, we will marry a person that with the same color of the skin because only they will understand us. So we were a little bit confused and some of us married and went to Africa, nothing good worked out, they came back. Some of us uh, married Russians, uh, different stories, but when you ask me, how do I feel myself? I think that in Russia, I'm definitely Russian, but I'm very concerned about all the issues of African-Americans cause I was brought on uh, music of Aretha Franklin. You know, uh, there is a very famous Russian singer, Russian uh, folk singer. And once she came to my show and she says, well, you don't look good to me. What was happening? And I said, well, you know, I'm exhausted. She says, when you're exhausted, all you have to do is to come to this beautiful Russian tree, Birozka. How do you call it? Birozka. How do you say it in English? Uh, um, birch tree. Yeah, it's considered to be a Russian uh, tree. So you hug it and the strength from the ground, from the earth will go directly into your heart and you will be, I don't know, whatever. So I thought, hmm, interesting, I'll try. I tried, didn't work. And then I said, hmm, probably I should go to Africa and arm a palm tree because that is an African tree. That's my tree. So I went to Tanzania looking for my family, for my father's family. I saw a palm. I grabbed it. I was standing for half an hour. Nothing happened. And I'm thinking, well, that's strange because I was expecting those butterflies flying through my stomach. I was expecting something that would say, yes, yes, I'm home. Fine, finally, finally, thank God I'm home. No. So I go to the United States and um, I was invited to go there on exchange program uh, to Christian Science Monitor in Boston. So that's my first city um, in uh, United States. And yes, it's beautiful. It's a cultural center and all that, but I feel that I'm abroad. Yeah, that's not my, my home. And then on the way back, I stopped in New York and I went to Harlem. And in Harlem, I went to a black church, Baptist church. And all of a sudden I started crying and I couldn't understand those tears because I was not that, you know, not that religious. And I couldn't understand why, what was happening. And then I realized the music gospel. I was brought up on gospel music. My mother used to put uh, Aretha Franklin. I know her by heart. So for me going to black church, it was like going home, but to my childhood home. 
Uh, so, uh, yes, I feel uh, America. I used to live in America. I spent, I'm a New York girl, okay? I spent there 13 years. So uh, I, I, I love America. Uh, but um, there is another very important thing. Uh, this is the pain that you have and that you feel. Let me explain to you. Uh, when you say September 11th, everybody knows what you're talking about. When you say in Russia, 1937, you don't even have to say 1937. You just say 37. Everybody knows what you're talking about. When you say 41, 45, everybody knows. Same thing. You say when Kennedy was killed, everybody knows those days. So uh, I guess home is when you don't have to explain things to somebody else and you feel the pain or any kind of memory that brings even the numbers. Uh, so I think I know both. Yeah, no, that is beautiful. And I think it's very subtle and very deep. So thanks for that. I've never heard you say that. So thank you. <laughs> um, you know, I have the, the big question for me, kind of as a person who's interested in Russia and probably for our audience lurking over this, is this, perception, and maybe it's a misperception, that Russia actually has a significant level of racism. So I, I guess I have to ask both of you, do you believe that that is correct or is it incorrect? And the other secondary question would be, how do you compare, I'm going to say racism, but let's say racial tension or, um, well, racism, in Russia and the United States. Are we talking about two different things or are they similar? Um, let's begin with Anne. It's really complicated, Jill. <laughs> Just to, and that's an understatement. And I say that because yes, there is this perception out there that, oh my God, I, you know, among black people, many black people, I'm not gonna go to Russia because we've heard everyone's racist there and you know, um, we're gonna have a hard time. We're gonna be discriminated against. It's not that black and white. It's not that cut and dry. I would say, you know, it's, it's knowing what is racism. If someone stares at you a lot, is that racist or is it curiosity? Um, if someone, you know, tells you a slur, yeah, immediately, if they call you a name, you think, yeah, that, that's racist. No one's ever called me a slur here or, you know, in terms of, you know, denigrated me verbally. But there is this sense of, it's, it, there is ignorance, and of course racism is ignorance. But here, it's the, it's the fact that people are just not used to seeing or being around as many black people. There isn't the institutional racism here compared to in the United States or in, in the United Kingdom, where, you know, yes, we live next door and we go to your schools and we work in your offices. Very different here in terms of, um, I've often been questioned first and foremost, where am I from? As opposed to, oh my God, you know, she's a black woman. There's often curiosity that, you know, they often think yeah, immediately, yes, African-American. That, you know, the thought of maybe a black Briton wouldn't come to mind immediately. And then it moves into race. I would say that things have changed over the past year because of what we've seen with the Black Lives Matter movement, the protests, all over the United States and Europe last year, there was a kind of awakening. I had many more questions put to me by Russians asking, oh my God, uh, have you ever been treated like that in the United States or in Great Britain? There's on every assignment I would say since that last year, I've had that question arise. Um, you, you know, and you, you, it's like, it's a long conversation. And you say, well, actually, yes. <laughs> and, and this is what's happened to me. And they would always ask, how does that compare to, to, to your experiences in Russia? And I even have some Russian friends, white Russian friends who have said to me, don't be ridiculous, there's, there's no racism here. I mean, I don't see you as a black person, you're Anne. And people will say, oh, that's ridiculous. But there is definitely something to that because I have had experiences where, you know, I'm, I'm talking to my, my old landlord one day um, back in the 90s and um, he's talking to me and he's like, in fact, he had introduced me to another friend of his and said, this is my tenant and she's great and we're chatting. And then a black guy walked by 
And my, my landlord looked at me and said, oh my God, there are all these black people here. And I'm like, excuse me, hello. <laughs> I'm a black person. So to me, that spoke volumes. It's, you know, it's just an example. So, but I'll let Liana uh, tune in as someone well, who was born and raised. And here. thank you. I agree with every word you say. And I want to add to your story with the mm -hmm. landlord. Yes. I have the best friend in my life. We were together since eighth grade at school. I mean, uh, if anything ever happened to me at some point, I considered if something happened, I would give my daughter to live with her, just for you to understand how close we are with her. And uh, one day uh, she was uh, her, okay, let me put it this way. Her husband was working in Africa. So uh, her son was living with her in Africa with his wife. Something happened, they divorced. So this young lady that divorced her son married an African. She got pregnant. Uh, I, went, uh, I came to Moscow and months later, I visited my best friend and I said, oh, by the way, how is uh, this Yulia girl that was pregnant uh, from her African husband? And she said, oh, thanks God, she had a miscarriage. And I said, well, how can you say those words? Thanks God, it's terrible. And she says, don't you understand? She would have a child that would, a black child that would be a brother to my grand, granddaughter. And I said, well, and, and she says, well, my granddaughter can't have black uh, half, step, uh, half brother. And it was such a shock to me because I know she's not a racist. I know she would sell a kidney for me. I know she, she, she would give anything for my daughter, but see, she doesn't see the color uh, of mine and of my family, but she does not want to be related, okay? Uh, to, uh, which is very difficult. You would say this is racism. You would say this is racism, but again, I know she's not racist and she lived in Africa. She did so many wonderful things for African kids, but there is something in the mind of a Russian, probably not only Russian, but in the mind that lives together, lives united. On one side, they're not racist. On the other side, the things you hear from officials on Russian television sometimes, it just blows your mind. And you understand there's no way you could listen to that to any European or in, even in American country. But uh, let me make it a little bit more clear. This is not against people of African heritage. It is more to people that are not Slavic looking, okay? This is, I would say xenophobic more than racism. Uh, because we have lots of people from Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, these are former Soviet republics. And look, people look darker there from Caucasus. People look darker, they're white, but they're darker. And they experience lots of, I don't want to say the word discrimination, but um, there, there, there are some on the level of uh, people, they feel sometimes not comfortable to the point that you could see ads in the newspaper saying that we will rent this place only to people with Slavic um, look. Mm -hmm. uh, again, it's not considered to be racism here. In fact, when I wanted to rent out a place, uh, my uh, person that was helping me the, with the rent, he says, Yelena, let's write that you will let in only Slavic people. We don't want others. And I said, well, what's wrong with ours? Look at me. And she says, it's not about the race, it's about the fact that they are not credit, um, they, they can't pay or they have another culture and you don't want people with another culture in your apartment. So it's uh, based on some of their uh, way of thinking, which we cannot say that because they think that black are bad. No, no, it's not about that. But it's about lots of other small things that look like racism for Americans, 
but we can call it some other word. But like, for example, I'm friends with a very famous talk show host. We work together. He used to be a correspondent in England. And he would say, you know, I don't want my son to marry African uh, person, not because I'm against African people, or I, I, you know, I'm friends, I love you and everything, but I want my grandkids to look like me. But the, that's it. Just, you know, I want the same culture. I want them to carry our heritage. Um, so it is much more complicated that well, we think. One more thing, in the 60s, in the 50s, yes, there was a policy that everybody's equal. You cannot call anybody names. Anne is absolutely right. In fact, if somebody called me a name in the street, and that would be a kid, his mother will kick him right away on the head, on the back, saying, you, don't you dare saying those things. Now, we don't have any policy like that, politics like that. Then everybody says whatever they feel like saying. And before we didn't have lots of African people or African-Americans. Now we have plenty of them. Number one, in the sixties, they started the university, Lumumba University. This place was exact only for mostly, mostly for students from Africa. Those students came and married Russians, sometimes didn't marry, but they had children, okay? They had children. So now nobody's surprised to see a black kid speaking Russian, number one. Number two, basketball, football, all those um, games where you could see lots of people of color uh, being recruited from uh, European or African or American countries. So you will not surprise anybody uh, with the color of the skin. And with that comes attitude. And the worst thing now, the worst, I believe in the last few years, we see coming from America. And I'm not blaming American Americans, I'm blaming Russian immigrants, that most of them are racist. And I live there, and that's why I'm telling you that. But they, with the internet, they speak. Russian people listen not to Americans because not everybody speaks English, but they listen to all those bloggers, bloggers that say awful things. I mean, you would think that he, his ancestors were lynched by African-Americans, the things they say. And uh, Russian people listen to them and they believe it. And they come to me and say, listen, is that true? Is that what they're saying? Like when there was um, Black Lives Matter march, there were some crazy Russians that would be saying that we are standing and pretending our, our house or our small Russian restaurants from those animals that are coming to destroy it. Who is going to come to destroy Russian small restaurant uh, with piroshki? But they say that and Russians here are listening and they believe in that. So all this propaganda that is coming from the United States here, I think is not helping out. You know, that um, I, I've seen some of that over the summer the Russian Russian American reaction to Black Lives Matter movement was very interesting, kind of disturbing in some cases. But you know, I want to move on to kind of another layer, which is the journalism part of it. But just a little housekeeping: um, we are now at the bottom of the hour. We're going to go for another like 10, 15 minutes, and then we're going to open it up to questions because we have an hour and fifteen minutes maximum. So um, in about 15 minutes, we'll be taking questions from the audience. So again, a reminder, uh, Kenan, you can send an email, Kenan at wilsoncenter.org, or you can go on Twitter at Kenan Institute, or you can go onto our Facebook page. So um, by the way, I was just thinking apropos of maybe nothing but literary, we're talking about one of the great the person who basically invented the modern Russian language, Alexander Pushkin, was of African descent. So I think it's, you know, that is an amazing part of Russian history that the person who created the most beautiful poetry and, and really literally created the modern language was part African. So we have- Russians know that, mm -hmm. everybody knows that, but they don't see him 
this way. Mm, it's separate things, you know? Yeah, well, these things, again, we're talking about very complex issues, but let me get into journalism. And I want to ask both of you, um, you know, you're journalists and especially maybe we'll start with Anne and you're coming from the UK, come to Russia, you're doing um, reports in which you travel throughout Russia, et cetera. How has your race affected you uh, in your work as a journalist? Has it, uh, you know, hurt or um, created challenges for you? Or as you hinted about a half an hour ago, it might open up some opportunities. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I, I certainly don't think that it's been uh, a disadvantage. Um, I actually feel that uh, in many ways, uh, especially outside of Moscow, working in the hinterlands or uh, in remote places, um, it's an advantage because people basically want to get to know who I am as well. And people are going to stop to be interviewed by me because they want to be, they want to interview me afterwards about, well, who are you? Where are you from? And even ask questions when I say, you know, I've lived for year, years in the United States and also um, I am an American as well as a Brit. Um, and they want to ask about, um, you know, how black people really do live in the United States. Uh, and it, it's interesting because there is a lot of, um, of propaganda, as Liana mentioned, and it's what people are fed. If you're only seeing certain broadcasts, certain uh, video clips on television, then you're thinking, well, my gosh, is that's what's happening? And I'll give you an example, the Black Lives Matter marches last year. A lot of the footage that I saw on state TV was only with black people looting or burning things down. There was you know, nothing more than that. This is what, this is, what is happening in the United States. Um, and on, regrettably, a lot of those images were just with black people in them. I would say that when it comes to officialdom, there is, there's no difference. I have not um, experienced any disadvantages being a black person reporting here. Um, again, you know, th there's a level of sophistication when it comes to uh, high level officials. Um, and they've certainly been very open to my company. I just happen to be the bureau chief here. Um, so I would say that, uh, that there is a mix, but there is still, you know, this, um, I get questions from people out in the field sometimes that you think, well, don't you know that it's 2020? And I'll give you, you know, kind of an example, just um, that, oh, wow, you someone did say to me out on, the, on one assignment that, wow, you know, um, you've got this, you know, really prominent position with the Wall Street Journal and gosh, um, do you play basketball and do you play, you know, instruments too? And can you dance? Kind of the stereotypes, you know? And my thing is I always tell people, no, I, I don't gyrate, thank you very much. <laughs> and kind of stop the conversation right there. Yeah, I happen to play basketball. I'm a tall woman. <laughs> but, um, you know, there are still certain stereotypes linked to Black people that you can achieve. If you're black, you can achieve and, and do well if it's in certain fields. So there is sometimes a surprise that the person running the Bureau of the Wall Street Journal is a black woman. Hmm. And Liana, I remember, you know, again, going back to when we met, you were, I, I think you were a print journalist at that point. You were, you were pretty early in your career. And then uh, I remember later you went on to that famous talk show, Pro Eta which was actually about sex in the Soviet Union. And um, so you have it now, obviously, a very different experience from Anne's because you're in Russia, you're you know, growing up there, you're a journalist. But how did your race affect um, your ability to you know, appear on TV, broadcast, do journalism? Well, uh, let me put it this way. I don't think that my race was a problem when I was looking for a job, but it was very difficult for me to find it because of my American heritage. The fact that my grandparents were from the United States uh, meant that my heritage is in the country that is an enemy. That was a cold war when I was becoming a journalist. And if I was white, probably if my grandparents were white, Hold on a second, there is a problem. Yeah, I think unfortunately, we may have to wait till Lena comes back. 
Anne, let me um, continue. And, and this is kind of probably gonna be our last question. I hope we can get Anna back. But um, the question would be, you know, when, um, I've been in Russian studies and journalism, et cetera. In the early days of my um, studying Russian and then also in journalism, I have encountered very few African Americans specifically who went into Soviet studies. And there are many reasons for that, but, um, you know, which we could get into. But I just look forward to we get Lena back. Yes, yes, I'm back. She's back. Hey. Yes. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Somebody rang on the phone. That's the problem when you're working off the telephone. So, yes. do you hear me? We do perfectly. And please, I'm sorry, Anne, let's finish no, up not at all. Mm -hmm. uh, with Lena. And Lena, we have about five minutes. So, I want to ask a quick question of Anne as well. But if you can please continue with your comments, Liliana. Uh, I forgot the question. Oh, okay. So, if I was, if my uh, ancestors were white, probably in the second or third generation, uh, nobody would even notice the fact that uh, my grandparents were Americans. But since I'm black, it was so easy to figure out that uh, they came from the United States. So when we were talking about whether it helped my career or not, the race, I don't think that the race meant anything, but uh, American heritage meant a lot. That is a very interesting point. Uh, okay, so last question, and then we do go on to questions um, from the audience. The last question would be, um, as I was beginning to tell Anne, uh, when I was studying Russian and becoming a journalist, I encountered, unfortunately, very few African-Americans who were involved in the study of Russian, who went on uh, you know, to work in the field. And it really, even I think to this day, there are not that many of them. So what are your expectations and maybe hopes for the future in terms of encouraging people of color to get into this field? Even, you know, it could be Russian studies, it could be journalism dealing with Russia. And Anne, why don't you start? Mm -hmm. I would, you know, very much encourage, uh, you know, people of, of color in particular, young black journalists to expand their horizons and, uh, and kind of be more open minded and also not be allowed to be pigeonholed because I think one of the issues is that, um, you know, if you're black, well, you're going to be interested in being a correspondent in Africa. Yes, I was interested in being a correspondent in Africa, but my passion also happens to be Form, the former Soviet Union and Russia today. And so I think it's very easy to kind of get steered early on um, into a certain kind of um, category that uh, you are, you know, kind of pigeonholed, as I mentioned, or stereotyped into a, certain, into a certain group or a particular area of coverage. And I would say that's one thing to try and avoid. Russia has got such a, a rich history, literature, I mean, obviously many other countries do as well. I would be hopeful that um, people would be more open-minded and, and give Russia a chance. Okay, and Lena, you have this perspective again, you know, Europe, the United States, Russia, and your own personal history. So what would you say? Do, do you believe that there will be more people of color who will get involved in this field? People of color from the United States or from Russia? Well, it, uh, listen, actually, good point. It, I would say either, either. Well, see, Russian, Black Russians um, are interested in lots of different things. So for them, it's not an issue if you're Black, that means you have to be interested in Africa or America. We don't have that stereotype. Um, I met a couple of journalists and they are interested in fashion, they're interested in music. One of the girls, she lives in New York, she's interested in international field. So um, I don't think that's an issue, but African-Americans in the United States, I think, yes, there is such a stereotype. In fact, I remember when I first came to United States, uh, and we would be meeting at some conferences, journalist conferences, and people would be speaking about Russia. And then I would say a word and they would look like, why would you talk about Russia? You know, you, why won't you talk about something that you 
sort of understand. Mm -hmm. And then I would say, well, because I'm Russian. And they're, oh, well, that's another issue. And they would start, you know, respectfully speaking, but they just couldn't uh, expect me being black, uh, talking about uh, Russia or probably even Europe. They, they think that we're interested only in African issues. Yeah, I get, you know, I was watching a, a video the other day, music video, and it's a Russian video, young kids, and uh, they're kind of hanging out in an apartment. I think it looked like St. Petersburg, kind of, you know, cool uh, apartment. And there was a young, I would call him black, I'm not quite sure if he was Russian or who he was, but he was kind of featured prominently and his very cool uh, images, you know, very attractive, interesting stuff. And I, I do see that openness uh, creeping in, maybe not creeping in, it's totally part of this world culture that we're seeing that I think is being more accepting of- Oh, absolutely. You know, when rap just started, uh, I never expected it to be in Russia because in Russia, it's considered to be a music of uh, black, uh, I don't know, Harlem or something, you know, definitely not European and not, not Russian. But guess what? We have fantastic rap singers. They're very good. In fact, they are intellectual, intellectual guys uh, that are, when they're doing this battle rap, they're quoting Shakespeare, they're quoting Dostoevsky. And uh, even I don't understand half of the things they're saying. So they took rap mm -hmm. to another level. Uh, we have people that love blues. We have people that love gospel. We have, you know, very, very intellectual people that uh, embrace American and African-American culture. Uh, and then we have people, bigots. And, you know, well, what can you do? They are everywhere. That's definitely true. I do think um, a lot yeah, of you, it, just to interject, is, um, is, is generational also. I think the younger generation certainly, and I think this can be said for, uh, of young people around the world, probably more open-minded, more worldly, more open to things that they see in, on social media. And of course, music and culture transcends borders, especially music. Mm -hmm. And sports. And sports. You both kind of answered the first question that we had from our audience, which was about your um, Russia becoming, is Russia becoming a more multiracial uh, society, more accepting of multiracial families, music, et cetera. And I think um, without getting too deep into it, it sounds like you both are saying yes. Yeah. I certainly think so. Yes. I mean, there is, a, it's got a long way to go, but there's a lot more openness compared to, you know, 10, 20 years ago. And, and I, I expect that it's going to continue um, in kind of the positive direction in terms of tolerance. And certainly with uh, the movements that we've seen um, around the world, kind of, you know, there's a, there's more of a consciousness now. So. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a question here, Lena, um, I want to give this to you. Uh, is it hard, in your experience, is it harder for Black men in Russia than for Black women? How would you compare these experiences? That's from Peter Ruffman. I, I'm absolutely sure that it used to be much harder for Black men because usually the students in, Af uh, in Lumumba University, young men, they had fights with young Russian men. Yes, definitely. The answer is yes. Students, females, they would stay in the dorm. They would not go anywhere. They're quiet. They just sit there. They don't make friends with Russian females. They just have friends in their room, some kind of closed African community, females. Boys, they want to go out. They start dating Russian girl. Oh my God, you can imagine what happens after that. And there are lots of stories based on the fact that uh, they're dating our girls. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, I remember that from living in my dormitory in Leningrad, where we had African students. And I think it was like every Saturday night, there'd be a big fight after everyone was drinking vodka and uh, going to dances. And you know, that, that was the usual end of that. But 
that is another story. We have a great question here um, from Linda Feldman, also one of my colleagues and friends. Oh, do you know Linda Feldman? She was in Christian Science <laughs> Monitor, and I went to work uh, on exchange program even to, to her newspaper, and she came to Moscow to my Moscow newspaper. Fantastic. Again, there is like two degrees of separation. <laughs> and uh, so Linda probably is a friend of all of ours, but Linda has a question, which I think is great. Yena, you spoke of discrimination against people from other republics. Back in the 1980s, when I, Linda, studied and reported in the USSR, I would hear Russians speak of those darker skinned republics as black people, Chorumia Luji. Correct. Okay, in a negative way. Have the norms of discourse changed as they have in the United States? Also, for either Lena or Anne, how much, and this, this is a great question, how much is the subject of racial ethnic discrimination covered in the Russian media? So Lena, um, picking up on that, you know, and then- Yes, that's exactly what I was referring to when I said that it's, more, not more race issue, but more ethnic issue. Uh, those people that live, former Soviet republics were, uh, let's say, uh, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, uh, Caucasus, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, they're darker skin. And Slavic people refer to them as uh, blacks. Yeah, that's correct. And um, see, there are lots of reasons for that. Some of them are, if we're talking about today, economical, because most of people from Tajikistan, they come to Russia as gastarbeiter, um, guest workers. Guest workers. Yeah. guest workers, yeah, they're guest workers. And uh, people refer to them as guest workers, as people of the second um, class people. And uh, most of those people that come from, uh, let's say, Armenia, they uh, work um, in the market. They sell uh, meat, they sell vegetables. So people look down on them as well. Uh, and, you know, there, there are some um, social reasons for that uh, issue. And there are lots of immigrants. Most of them, they're not, we don't have immigrants from Estonia. We don't have immigrants from Baltic republics where white people are. Uh, we, we don't have, well, Belarusia, they, they just look like Russians. We're not talking about politics right now. We're talking about ethnicity and Ukrainian. So you can't see a difference. So I insist that Russians don't like people that look like them, not all of them. But my point is, it's very difficult to say that it's racism. It's more uh, different. Yeah, you're different. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really matter whether you're from Africa uh, or you're from Tajikistan. You're different, and I don't like you. Mm -hmm. and, and not and everybody, of course. Not everybody. Right. Yeah. And in terms of the press coverage, is yes. what you want to say? Oh. Uh, no, the answer is no. Unfortunately, the press doesn't touch this issue at right. all. In fact, there were some cases that um, uh, there was a female, she is a big boss in our Duma. Duma is like Congress. And during the uh, football, I believe we had a championship of the world in football or during the Olympic Games, I don't remember. It was a couple of years ago. All of a sudden, she comes out and says, dear Russian females, please don't have sex with Africans that will come here because you might have children from that. And then we don't know what to do with those children because they're black and nobody wants them. And the press started writing me and saying that this is disgusting and please make your comment. And again, uh, I was very upset. I was glad that the press was mad at that, but I was very upset that none of her political uh, bosses would come out and say, now look, we don't have anything to do with that. Now, this woman says, in fact, we told her that you can't say things like that. Well, her point was that please don't sleep with them because uh, then you, if you choose to give up the kid that was born out of uh, marriage, Nobody will adopt this kid. Probably she had that in mind. God knows what she had in mind. But she went out 
and that was a very big scandal. Or let's say we have a um, uh, very famous female uh, Sapchak, Senya Sapchak. Uh, she is a famous uh, journalist and uh, she was a candidate uh, to president. But sometimes she makes some racist comments, uh, which even led to her losing a contract with, I believe, Audi car. She had a very good contract and they refused to prolong this uh, contract because of some of her comments. Uh, we have a couple of journalists uh, on a very good newspaper, uh, I mean, radio station, which I respect very much. And she's a very uh, prominent journalist and she allows herself uh, to make some comments, which is in America would be considered to be racist. But in Russia, we have different level of uh, what's calling uh, racism. And in America uh, and in Russia, it's so different because America had a different history of racism. In America, racism is when you can't get a job because you're black, when you can't get an apartment because you're black, when you Nobody wants to live with you in one neighbor. I mean, you can't get in a special school. Nobody will uh, tell your kid that uh, you can't go to the school because you're, you're black. So it's very different and you cannot compare those uh, racisms. It's much more sudden and it's more ignorance, stupidity, and uh, it's very easy to channel those anger against those blacks. When I mean blacks, I don't mean people of race, but it's easy to channel this anger that comes uh, from time to time than to explain why uh, there are problems with unemployment, let's say. Mm -hmm. I, I actually agree, right. just, just to interject one thing more on that. So last year when we had the Black Lives Matter movement protests around the world, um, that the way the press covered it here, I found was very much, look what's happening over there. We don't have those problems. That's their problem. Look, my goodness, this is a racial issue there. Of course, be lucky that you're here because you're not seeing that in Russia. Exactly. exactly. Well, that, that uh, Anne, reminds me very much of the old days in the Soviet Union where racial disparities in the United States were actually exploited for propaganda purposes uh, by the Russian media. Um, that was a common thing back in the Soviet days. Is it the same or is it different? It sounds kind of similar. There, there are some similarities, I suppose. It's kind of political though, I, isn't it? Um, I would say though that, uh, that there isn't as much coverage here. I mean, of, as, as Liana has said, of race matters in general. Um, you're not gonna pick up the paper like every day as you can in the United States and have some story that relates to race or something that has happened. And again, this goes back, I think, as Liana also said, to the histories of both of these countries. Um, we're talking about you know, one country that had uh, uh, slavery for how many you know, hundreds of years and then still has a level of institutional racism. Um, and here it's very much, um, uh, they're not used to living to uh, having a lot of black people living next door, so to speak, as we say. So that makes a, that makes a big difference. There's still a level of, um, well, certainly yeah. ignorance and curiosity. So we have uh, just about 15 minutes. So a uh, reminder again, if you have questions, audience, um, you can send them by email Kenan at wilsoncenter.org or by Twitter, Ken at Kenan Institute, or you can go onto the Facebook page for the Wilson Center Kenan Institute. Uh, so looking forward to other questions and we're getting quite a few. Here's one that I think is, is um, picking up kind of on the Chordomea Yudi, black people, you know, but who are not black, but they are from other um, less developed parts of the former Soviet Union. Um, and here's the question. In America, identity is closely tied to politics where many Americans yearn to see leaders who look like them. Taking into account the differences in American and Russian politics and political systems, are there any movements among people of African descent, Central Asian descent, et cetera, to fight for representation in politics. Lena, I guess we'll start with you. 
I don't think so. Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. See, uh, even for you to understand, in America, there would be neighborhoods where uh, African Americans or Chinese or uh, I don't know, Italians live, right? In Russia, uh, it doesn't work this way. Everybody lives everywhere. You cannot say that this neighborhood belongs to that ethnicity or Jews. You could say historically, probably Jews live, used to live there, but now they live everywhere. Now, yeah, they, there are places where there are synagogues and probably a little bit more Jews live there, but you cannot say that uh, our country is uh, sort of um, uh, very much uh, ethnically united or any, so politically, we don't have a party that represents Caucasian people uh, from the Caucasus or the party that represents people from, uh, uh, I don't know, Baltic republics or the party that represents uh, Jews. No, no, you can have a Georgian person that probably in Congress, you can have a uh, vice president or, well, right now we have Mishustin. He is Russian, but he has uh, Armenian uh, roots, but nobody refers to him as to Armenian. He is still sort of Russian. Mm -hmm. And Anne, what about you? Have you seen any indication, Anne is saying no, basically not, any indication of political movements among people of color? No, I agree. I agree with Vienna. There, there certainly isn't uh, any kind of political movement. Uh, again, you know, you can be of Jordan heritage or Armenian or Kazakh heritage and still be within a Russian party. There is no kind of separate party. I think that was one of the but someone else has told me this, they felt that was one of the positives of, the, of being the Soviet Union before, where everyone was Soviet. You weren't defined by your, oh, I'm you know, Azeri or Armenian. No, you were Soviet. And to a certain extent, there's a holdover of that. That's kind of an extension of that. Mm -hmm. um, there, there were, I read a few kind of last year again, during you know, the, uh, the Black Lives Matter protests, I did read a few kind of social blogs from young black Russians uh, trying to make their voices heard. And there was one young lady in particular whose name escapes me, but she did mention that she had a lot of backlash when she started to talk about the fact that, you know, some of her acquaintances would mention the fact that her hair looks different or where do you get your hair done? Or, and she would challenge them on it. And she mentioned that she got some backlash from that. And why are you complaining? You're in Russia where we don't have racism. You could be in the United States now and see what you would be suffering. So there is, you know, there are a few people out there uh, trying to kind of push back, but they have met some, some, you know, been met with backlash as well. Mm. Liana, there's a question uh, for you specifically about how receptive is your audience to topics of ethnic or racial diversity in your shows or in your reporting? Do, actually, I guess the question we'd have to back up, do you tend to focus on that at all or not? Is that question to whom? To Nina. Nina. Yes. Well, but I don't do news. I do talk show. Yes, but I mean, on your talk show, do you ever get into these issues? Of, you know, no, issues? again, again, that's not the major problem. We can have people with different heritage. In fact, I could have somebody with African uh, from African descendant, but that's never an issue of the show uh, because we don't really have lots of uh, events about the different ethnicity. So no, we, I, I, I don't recall that. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, uh, there's another, oh, more questions coming in. Let me just take a quick look at this. Um, now that's, you know, there are two questions that are kind of similar. Um, one is about a kind of an overall question. I think we kind of answered this, but because we'll look at it again. Is there a systemic racism in Russia against Blacks? It's a very simple question, but, and then a question about anti-Chinese racism. Do the panelists see this as something that could impact relations between Russia and China? I think we're, we're kind of, if I can turn it around a little bit, we're kind of back to that xenophobic versus, xenophobia versus racism quandary. And could you just kind of 
to finish this debate here. Yeah. Can you kind of walk us through that again? What is it? I would say in terms of systemic racism or institutional racism, no. Uh, this is not the United States. And I think it's very easy to, to try and make comparisons, but those types of comparisons uh, should not be made because this country has a very different history. They did have slaves in terms of serfs, but these were people who were born and raised here, were not shipped here in, in, a, in the hold of a ship, were not stolen from another country. They were here and it was more of kind of a classy system. Um, I would say that, um, sorry, I, I just uh, slipped my mind the second part. Chinese, that, Chinese. Chinese. Yes, I have actually reported quite a bit on the uh, anti-Chinese sentiment. A lot of that has to do with, with economics. Um, in the Far East, uh, Chinese are buying up land and being given, um, not even being given, but having access to um, lots of hectares of land for, for farming. Um, in Irkutsk along at Lake Baikal and in other areas, there, there has been some pushback at the, at the local level from people who have actually gone as far as to say, oh, there's a Chinese invasion. There are too many coming in here. There are lots of Chinese tourists pre-pandemic, of course. Um, so there has been um, a level of, I, I certainly believe and have reported on. And at um, the same time, in the Far East, uh, mm -hmm. the cities that are on the border with Chinese, you can see lots of Chinese married, mixed marriages, lots yes, of mixed indeed. marriages, lots mm -hmm. of children. You could see the restaurants in China, the stores, it's in Chinese language. Everything is so right. mixed there. Uh, we're very far. It takes 11 hours for me from Moscow to fly right. there. But when I went there, I was amazed. It was not as if it's not uh, Russia. Uh, everything was in Chinese language and they were not surprised. They, they never said anything bad about Chinese. Uh, the, and that's uh, the difference. When we're talking about corruption and economics, yes. Mm -hmm. When we're talking about just families living together, no. Uh, so we have to uh, make a difference between those anti-Chinese uh, comments. Are they made well, uh, about people as a nation or about economical invasion or corruptional uh, invasion when people uh, in Russia find out that lots of wood, very expensive wood is yeah. sold as sent there or water is taking out or land that is destroyed by something where that Chinese do chemical things that Chinese do. It's not against Chinese as people, it's against the uh, economical and social. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very good point. And I would also say that obviously the Russian government is cultivating very strong ties with China economically because you know it's, it's a big neighbor next door. There has been a lot of cooperation, a lot of investment from the Chinese in Russia. And, and that's something that the government here has definitely been pushing. Mm -hmm. I agree on the economics part of it because the racism, or let's say uh, animosity toward others that I have seen in Moscow was directed for quite a while, a couple of years ago, about the laborers from Central Asia who were digging up the sidewalks and, to, and building new sidewalks. And I heard more Russians say, you know, damn, these people, what are they digging up our sidewalks? We can't walk, our cars can't drive. And then they would get into what I would consider slurs using Chordome when the people were not Chordome, they were Central Asians. And I think it was this feeling they are other, they are less educated, they may not even speak Russian. And so they're outsiders and they're you know, messing up our daily life. But I want to end on one question because we literally have like five minutes at the most. And for both of you, let's look toward the future, uh, the future of black people, people of color uh, working in journalism who are working either in Russia uh, or working reporting on Russia what are your hopes and, and aspirations for people like that who want to get into the field? And uh, Anne, you start, okay? Well, I'm very optimistic. I think that uh, you know now there's a lot of interest uh, in Russia in general, and maybe it's generated because, of course, in the U.S., they're talking about 
sanctions against Russia, you would hope that people would start to think, well, why is the US imposing sanctions? That may trigger some interest. I am hopeful that um, just the very fact that uh, the, the, the world is so small, and I really do hope that there'll be an opportunity once we're over this pandemic for people to, to travel to Russia. That's so important to break down some of the stereotypes that exist out there. Come and see for yourself. There's good and bad everywhere, as we know, but I really do think that uh, coming to Russia, making an effort to, to see for yourself what this place is all about will make an ex extremely huge difference. Great. And Yena, we've just got a couple of minutes left. But well, I agree with everything Anne says. And before uh, people start traveling as earlier, there is internet, there is clubhouse. Mm -hmm. And I wish people would just get in contact. You don't need to ask anybody's permission. If you are African-American, you have all the rights to get into clubhouse of Russian. If you speak Russian, if you study Russian, please go ahead and uh, practice Russian, ask the questions. Young generation, they are open for discussions. You can make friends and nobody controls it. Nobody will even know that you are doing that. So don't be afraid of Big Brother following you mm -hmm. and uh, just welcome. I think Russia is a wonderful, very interesting, a rich, culturally rich country. There are lots of wonderful people. Uh, so I will be just happy to see more people, uh, African-Americans coming here. Well, that is a fantastic way to end this fantastic session. I really have to thank you very much, Ann Simmons, Yelena Kanga. You really, I think, you know, you took us beyond these kind of simplistic approaches to this very complex issue. And I want to thank you, you know, personally and professionally for everything that you said. And I want to thank the audience who had some great questions. And uh, remember that the Kennan Institute uh, has a lot online, you can check out Black History Month programming. And um, we're always interested in ideas, you know, for things that we can pursue. A lot of scholars looking at different issues at the Wilson Center and specifically at the Kennedy Institute. So thank you very much everybody for attending and we look forward to seeing you again. And this Vidanya to Moscow. Thank you. Thank you.